I'm very pleased to be able to speak to Mr. Winston Lo, the chairman of the Hong Kong Trade Development uh, Council, and a businessman in his own right, a very prominent uh, property developer in Hong Kong and in China. The first question I really want to ask you is this, that we all see the numbers. Global trade is slowing dramatically, despite an era where there's a lot of um, bilateral and multilateral arrangements you know, taking place all around the world. What do you think is happening? Basically, I think we're seeing a lot of economies slowing down. And particularly in Europe, it's you know, even negative growth. So I think that is going to curb uh, purchase, right? Even in China, um, the, the, the imports has also come down quite dramatically. It's because uh, local people are seeing a 7% growth as more like a recession. So it's also the psychology as well as the actual purchasing power. Um, overcapacity? Overcapacity, I think, should, if anything, should encourage uh, exports and imports because uh, overcapacity will force prices down. You're a property developer. You understand overcapacity, yes. and you understand it uh, over a period of time. Um, but the overcapacity we find now is on every front, from raw materials to property um, and to uh, in, in infrastructure. Um, how long do you think this will take to work out in a, for a country like China? Um, China, of course, the overcapacity is quite phenomenal, but with the Belt and Road Initiative. Hopefully, China can bring some of their capacity to the other 60-odd countries, which is in desperate need for uh, machineries to produce so that they can have local consumption. Uh, I think that actually can work itself out. But, but more so in the uh, infrastructure side, I don't believe China is actually over capacity in infrastructure. The reason why China has grown so steadily and, and at such a high rate over the past 30 years is basically because the infrastructure is there. If you look at India, um, the growth rate is not the same. It's because the infrastructure is just not, not, not there to support. Correct. So only today, um, the Chinese government revised its um, you know, outlook. Um, and as it slows, um, well, how do you think we should be reading that slowdown? Uh, because, you know, as somebody else pointed out, China still produces a Germany every four years uh, in terms of GDP growth. Um, even if it went down to about 5%. So how, how do you read slowdown and how should, you know, the rest of the world take that slowdown? I think slowing down to 7% growth is more than acceptable, right? 7% growth in terms of the world, it's still at the very top. But people are so spoiled by looking at China growing at double digits for a long, long time. And that is not sustainable, the, the past model of export and also investment. That's why you mentioned there's so much overcapacity. Mm -hmm. Now China is trying to transform its economy, also restructure, rebalance its uh, economy. Yeah. Then it, it, it's a necessity to slow down. How were you at the, uh, the Trade Development Council reading the trade flow figures in the last few years? Because a lot of it was actually financing um, through using the trade corridor uh, in that a lot of Chinese corporates were actually borrowing uh, offshore uh, to fund their onshore development. It wasn't actually trade in that, in that regard. Uh, and now that's um, the financing aspect is uh, is in a turmoil because of the, remin the changes in the renminbi and so on. How are you reading it two years ago and how are you reading it today? I think two years ago, everybody was expecting the renminbi to continue to appreciate. Yes. Now reality has set in, the renminbi has depreciated quite significantly in the past few months and so everybody is taking a hit. And just now you mentioned about borrowing money from overseas, uh, using it as trade figures, to help their own domestic um, development. Yeah. Uh, I think it's basically an issue of lower interest rate overseas and also appreciation of the renminbi. If you can borrow at a cheap cost and also your, 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 your renminbi is going to appreciate, that you know, it's a double win right. situation, but it's no longer the case. Right. So how do you think it's going to play out? Well, um, I and think 
be, there will be a lot more onshore uh, bonds issues or bond uh, or, or financing from local so using RMB because, like myself as a developer, I'm selling in RMB. I'm also building in RMB. Why should I be borrowing overseas money? At even at a lower rate, but you know, uh, in today's uh, environment, it's hard to really see how it's going to go. Whether the RMB is going to continue to depreciate or to stop here or to appreciate, it's very very difficult. Yes, uh, on the real estate front, that being the the high end of the uh, investment um, um, you know spectrum, are you still confident in China? Are you still invested? Are you still engaged? Yes. I'm still very confident in the property sector, but of course, there's a lot of overbuilt in certain, particularly in the third and fourth tier cities. And also, I think the economic development is not consistent throughout the whole country. In a city like Shanghai, it's still uh, such big demand for properties. I launched one of my projects for sale recently, and it was sold out in one day at record prices. And a city like Shanghai is transforming itself to becoming like a New York and London, an international finance center. So there still needs to be quite a bit of facilities and infrastructure and housing or offices to be built. And how do you think the inflation component starts building it? Because China does have its own quantitative easing, so there's the the system is actually flushed with um, you know domestic currency. So do you think that it will show up in in property prices? And Probably not too much. Property prices, I think it, you cannot generalize to say the whole market is going to behave accordingly. Uh, I think in cities like uh, Shanghai and particularly Shenzhen, prices have been starting to shoot through the roof. In Shenzhen, for example, last year grew over 30%. Right. But in the third, fourth tier cities, prices are dropping and still no buyers. Right. And, and what do you think is the medium term impact or other medium term prospect for the third and fourth tier cities? How do you think it's going to work through? Um, is there going to be a repopulation or a reconfiguration of their, of their business model? Um, the central government recently had an economic work uh, meeting, work conference, and they've decided that uh, the stocking of the property sector is one of the priorities. I guess they will have to come up with um, uh, policies and incentives for people to buy in the third and fourth tier cities. Like for example, tax deductible, and maybe the uh, deposits, and maybe using the provident fund uh, to help them purchase. I think all these are in the pipeline. Right. So they still have uh, arrows in their oh, yes. quiver yes. to... to yes. there, there's a lot of leverage the, the, the Chinese government can still uh, make use of, for sure. Let's put on your policy-making hat. Um, Hong Kong and the uh, One Belt, One Road. Um, I've heard nothing but One Belt, One Road you know, in, in this, in this um, trip to Hong Kong. Um, um, and as a policy driver, and the Trade Council being a, a policy tool, um, you've actually identified several industries where the supply chain works in favour of Hong Kong being a player in that regard. Um, um, how much of that is, you know, how much of that is achievable? Uh, for Hong Kong? For the Belt and Road, I think it's really a golden opportunity for Hong Kong to play a very important role in the whole exercise. Why am I saying that? It's because it's 65 uh, nations and it's all in different areas of the world with different culture, history, um, even the legal system or religion or ways of doing things. So Hong Kong have been trading with all these nations for a long period of time. And also, Hong Kong is really a hub where financing, professional services, and I think in the future, Hong Kong can play a very clear role of investment center, uh, financing center, professional services support center, and then back office for companies wanting to invest into the Belt and Road. And that's on a very high general level. But I'm speaking as a businessman now. If I want to invest into the Belt and Road projects, how do I go about doing it, mm. right? If you are just a private enterprise, it's not easy to consider how and where you're going to start. 
So if we can help them by identifying the projects and coming up with hopefully a standard uh, loan agreement, a standard investment agreement, then it, it's going to make life a lot easier for the investment and also for the country's concern. We're going to be that super connector between the different nations and the investors and the resources of the world. One step back and the TDC's uh, role in promoting services. Uh, I think the TDC's role in um, promoting trade, uh, trade in goods is very clear. But in services, what has the TDB been, TDC been doing uh, that, that um, you know, that, that's very clearly, uh, you know, trying to get the services sector going. Well, we've been doing that in Hong Kong, promoting our uh, professional services for many years now. But unfortunately, because TDC, the name Trade Development Council, I think is giving people that wrong uh, <laughs> image that oh, we're only focused on trade. We're not just focused on trade. What um, specific projects can you point to that demonstrates that your Belt Road, um, you know, involvement, engagement is working. Um, do you have specific uh, examples, uh, case studies that, that, uh, that you can say, look, this is what we've been doing? Yes. Um, we have signed, for example, a, a cooperation uh, MOU with uh, a, an organization called Yabuli uh, in China. Yabuli is a private enterprise um, sort of club. It's the biggest private enterprise that will be their members. They have had a one-day workshop with us, and they were so excited that they wanted to sign a cooperation agreement with us. I think that is a very good indication because typically all these big companies, they just go with the Chinese government and go to these places to make their own investment, but they recognize that TDC and Hong Kong can help them make that job easier. And that's why they want to work with us. And uh, in the next few months, we're going to be lining up all our strategic partners. And hopefully by the middle of next year, um, not next year, this year, we will be able to uh, come and showcase what we're doing with all our partners. And, and this um, AIIB, um, are you, are you, um, you know, thinking about how to work with the AIIB or, or, or latch on to their... We will be working with everybody because um, our job, if we want to create that platform, we have to work with everybody. We want that platform to be serving the whole world. The Belt and Road, it's not going to be just a China project. It's going to be a world project. It's 4.4 billion people. But not all, that, all, not all those projects need to commence with Chinese money. No, no, I don't believe so. But I think the Chinese money will get it started. Right? But, but in the future, hopefully, um, everybody from all corners of the earth, if they see opportunities, they want to invest, they can go ahead. And um, again, uh, both as a businessman and as a policy uh, driver, um, trade agreements and today the TPP, uh, China being specifically excluded, um, and that versus, say, the APEC uh, arrangement, um, do you see, you know, overlapping corridors? Do you see uh, opportunities um, missing Hong Kong as a result of these macro players, um, you know, alignments? I, I, I don't worry too much about that. All these, of course, there's, there must be overlap. But um, politicians, um, they, they have to work on something. And all these trade agreements will be good. The main thing is we make them happen. I think that's a key to it. And, and anything that's pro promoting free trade will be a big welcome for okay. Hong Kong. What is your reading of TPP? Uh, you know, what do you think of it as a, um, as a mechanism in itself and the focus of the TPP? Um, well, it's uh, starting to happen, but I think it's still got a long process to go yet because all the countries have to go back to their own legislature to get it approved. I think that's going to be a long process. The fact that it's very um, IP-centric um, and therefore all of the industries that are IP-centric, uh, isn't that an area that Hong Kong would have wanted to uh, latch on to or benefit from? Yes, well, if we can join, I'm sure we will we'll consider very seriously. Uh, but, you know, I think all these are, are very political.
How developed are uh, IP based industries in Hong Kong? Um, well, Hong Kong, we actually have very good legal system. I think that's the best form of protection for IP. And that is why we're now looking at the possibility of doing a bit more in the technology side. And hopefully we, we will gain some uh, momentum. Actually, you know, you're probably the best person to answer this question because um, IP players who want to uh, be domiciled in Hong Kong, especially to reach out to China, find that Hong Kong is a very expensive place, mainly because of property prices. Yes. And property prices kills everything else. It's like a, it's like chemotherapy. You know, it's like uh, you know, it does good and does bad as well. And uh, therefore, some industries need a little bit more nurturing uh, in order to you know to find a foothold in Hong Kong. Unfortunately, I have to agree with you. Hong Kong property prices is way too high, but mainly it's because of supply and demand. There's very little supply and there's a lot of demand, so prices keeps going up. But hopefully the government will be providing more uh, housing for the market, then uh, at least price will, will, will stabilize. If prices stabilize and if prices start to soften, yeah. would you as a businessman diversify? And if you did, what would you be looking at? Mm, no, I think, I think Hong Kong, uh, basically, property prices um, will continue to uh, make good money for uh, investors. Of course, if you go in at the very peak of the market, it's difficult to say. But so far, so good. Touch wood, you know, uh, the Hong Kong market has, has been very rewarding for property developers. And, uh, uh, Hong Kong um, as a strategic location for East Asia is very clear. Um, how would you describe Hong Kong as a strategic location for Southeast Asia, for South Asia um, and the Middle East? Hopefully, Hong Kong can become the Asian hub, right? We are well connected to everywhere and hopefully with the Belt and Road, that's what we are trying to promote. We will have to work with everybody and we will have to make good use of our connections. And I think, uh, I think time will tell uh, how we can work with everybody. Vincent Lord, thank you very much for spending well, time you. with us. Yes.